The moment you read in the paper that Billy Graham is dead, you'll know that he's more alive than he's ever been before, and I'm in paradise. And I'm looking forward to it. Billy Graham entered into paradise one year ago this week at the age of 99. As we mark the first anniversary of his death, we wanted to share a look back at his life and ministry on this special episode of GPS, God, People, Stories. I'm Jim Kirkland. My co-host Phil Fleischman is away this week. You're going to hear from a number of people on this episode sharing memories of Billy Graham. One of them will be his son, Franklin. On June 14, 2007, my mother went to be with the Lord. Uh, she was my father's uh, best friend, soulmate, partners in life. They've been married for over 64 years. Now my father and mother uh, have made that same journey and they're together. And I can only imagine the reunion uh, when my mother met him at the gate, when he came into heaven in the presence of Almighty God. They're together with God in heaven. And it's because they made that decision for Jesus Christ. And you can secure your place in heaven by deciding to surrender your heart to Jesus Christ. And you can do that right now. We can tell you all about that at this website. It's findpeacewithgod.net. Findpeacewithgod.net. GPS. God. People. Stories. Billy Graham preached the message of Jesus Christ to more people in live audiences than any other person in history. Nearly 215 million people packed stadiums, arenas, and other venues in more than 185 countries and territories to hear him. And what they heard was this. God loves you and wants to have a relationship with you. Christianity is not a white man's religion. And don't let anybody ever tell you that it's white or black. Christ belongs to all people. He belongs to the whole world. His gospel is for everyone. That was 1973 in South Africa. 55 years before that, on a dairy farm just outside Charlotte, North Carolina, William Franklin Graham II was welcomed into the world. Billy, as he would be called, was the firstborn child of Frank and his wife, Morrow. Billy was always a boy full of life. He was a baby full of life. There was never any quietness about Billy. He was always tumbling over something. And uh, just uh, a real boy. When Billy was two, his sister Catherine was born, followed four years later by Melvin, and lastly by his sister Jean when Billy was 14. The Grams were faithful churchgoers, and their home life reflected those spiritual values. As Billy Graham approached his 16th birthday, controversy stirred the otherwise peaceful city of Charlotte. In the fall of 1934, a simple wooden tabernacle on Charlotte's east side became the focus of a stormy debate. Thousands of people were coming night after night to hear a Baptist preacher from Oklahoma, Dr. Mordecai Ham. As a young teen, Billy had become disinterested in the church, even cynical. Still, he finally agreed to go with a friend to one of Dr. Ham's meetings. I was a church member. I was a leader of the Young People's Society in our church. But uh, I still knew that something was lacking. I knew that I didn't have that personal relationship with Christ that I knew was there in the lives of other people. As Billy continued to attend the meetings, he became increasingly uncomfortable with the thought that the preacher was speaking directly to him. I remember that I decided the only way to escape this feeling was to try to apply for the choir. I can't even carry a tune to this day. But I went and joined the choir and sat up there and escaped his scathing uh, look or his strong finger. And one night when he gave the appeal, I came out of the choir and stood down there with uh, about three or 400 other people and made a commitment to Christ. The revival meetings led by Mordecai Ham in the fall of 1934 had changed the direction of Billy Graham's life. In September 1936, Billy set off for school at Bob Jones College in Cleveland, Tennessee. After a few months, Billy decided to transfer to Florida Bible Institute near Tampa. In the secluded, almost tropical campus surroundings, God's plan for Billy's life was gradually unfolding. Yet he still struggled against the call to preach. In an interview with TV talk show host Mike Douglas, Billy Graham vividly recalled the night in 1938 when he finally surrendered to God's call. 
I was in school in Florida, and it was the 18th green of a golf course uh, at about midnight. I was walking alone, and I could sense that God was speaking to me and calling me. And I got on my knees on that golf green, and the tears were coming down my cheeks. And I said, Lord, I'll do what you want me to do, and I'll be what you want me to be. You take my life and use it any way you want to. And from that moment on, there was a peace and a joy and a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction that hasn't decreased, it's grown. As Billy Graham's years at Florida Bible Institute drew to a close, an unexpected door of opportunity opened. He was accepted at Wheaton College near Chicago. In September 1940, the 21-year-old Billy Graham nervously drove his Green Plymouth onto the Wheaton campus. His life soon filled with new friends, classes, and work, and one very special relationship. Fellow Wheaton student Ruth Bell was the daughter of missionary parents. She had grown up in China during a period of great social unrest. It took Billy Graham a month to work up the courage, but he finally invited Ruth to go to a special production of Handel's Messiah at Wheaton College Chapel. Ruth shares her memories of the evening. There was something about Bill that when I went home that night, I got down on my knees and I just said, Lord, if he's the one, I mean, it's in your hands. But I, I definitely felt convinced that if God would let me spend the rest of my life with him, I consider it a tremendous privilege. They were married on August 13, 1943 in Montreat, North Carolina, shortly after their graduation from Wheaton. Billy was pastor of a small basement church in the Chicago suburb of Western Springs. As he devoted himself to his new congregation and to exploring fresh ideas for church outreach, the idea for a radio program took shape. And so one day I said, yeah, we've got to get uh, George Beverly Shea. Uh, he was program director at uh, WMBI in Chicago. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. The program was named Songs in the Night and it marked the start of a 60-year ministry with George Beverly Shea's songs setting the stage for Billy Graham's messages at crusades around the world. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. As the new radio program gained popularity, preaching opportunities began to unfold for Billy Graham. The young evangelist linked up with the ministry Youth for Christ, headed by Tory Johnson. He was soon sharing the message of Jesus with servicemen and young people at YFC rallies across the country. During World War II, Billy Graham was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army. But those plans changed when he became seriously ill. A generous radio listener gave Billy and Ruth vacation money and they gratefully went to Florida, where Billy could recuperate. About four or five doors down was Tory Johnson, whom we had come to know in Chicago. Tory outlined to me his vision for Youth for Christ International. And he said, Billy, if I started, would you come and be the first time worker in Youth for Christ? And I went back and talked to Ruth, and she said, I think God has given you the gift of evangelism, and I think you ought to do that. He resigned his pastorate and began the work of Youth for Christ International in earnest. It was at a YFC rally that Billy Graham first met the man who would go on to lead the music at virtually every one of his crusades for the next six decades. They called up a young fellow by the name of Cliff Barrows. My, he had those people doing everything but standing on their heads. And it was a wonderful service. And we've been together ever since. The Grahams resettled in Montreat, North Carolina, where they had wed and where Ruth's parents were living. Soon after, they celebrated the birth of their first child, Virginia, who was later called Gigi. The event which thrust Billy Graham into the national scene was the 1949 Christ for Greater Los Angeles campaign. And this evening, our message will be entitled, God's Message of 1949 to the people of Los Angeles. It began on September 25, 1949, and continued for eight weeks in a giant tent at the corner of Washington and Hill Streets in Los Angeles. 
Attendance reached 350,000 before the meetings came to an end in mid-November. One day, as the team arrived at the tent, they were surprised to find reporters poised to cover the service. And I said, what has happened? Why are you all here? And one of them said, you've just been kissed by William Randolph Hearst. The next day, in all of his newspapers across the country, and he was the leading press lord in the country at that time, it was on the front pages of all those papers that something was happening in California. And it wasn't long till it was one of the major news stories in America for a short time. But the team always knew that the real story was in the lives of those people who had been transformed by God's love. They also knew that the credit for all of it belonged to someone other than themselves. Cliff Barrows explains. God has done it and God has sustained it. And certainly it's marvelous in our eyes. In the summer of 1950, two persistent advertising executives traveled to Billy Graham's crusade in Portland, Oregon. For days, Walter Bennett and Fred Dinard tried to corner a reluctant Billy Graham to discuss the possibility of his beginning a Christian program on the ABC radio network. So I said, well, we can go on radio for 13 weeks if we have 25,000 dollars. And I said, if it comes in tonight, I said, I'll consider that as from the Lord. If it doesn't come in tonight, $25,000, I'll consider that God has said no. That evening at the crusade, Billy briefly presented the opportunity to the audience. The crowd chuckled along with him over the slim odds of that much money being raised before the night was out. But after the service, a steady stream of people dropped by with cash, checks, and pledges that totaled $24,000. Cliff Barrows says Walter Bennett and Fred Dinard offered to make up the difference themselves. And Bill said, no, not on your life. He said, we didn't that. We asked the Lord for $25,000. And he said, let's just wait. As the team returned to the hotel just before midnight that evening, the desk clerk held out two envelopes to them. Each contained a check for $500, the exact amount needed. It was the beginning of a radio ministry that continued into the 21st century. This is the hour of decision. The hour of decision program was part of a new broader ministry. Although Billy Graham didn't like his name being included, the rest of the team decided that the ministry should be called the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. The incorporation papers required a statement of purpose. It was simple and direct, to transmit, spread, and propagate the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ by any and all means. And it continues to do just that under the direction of Billy's son, Franklin. The work at, at uh, Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, it, it's about taking this challenge uh, to men and women that they would put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ because God loves each and every one. The Billy Graham Evangelistic Association was headquartered in Minneapolis until its move in 2003 to Billy Graham's hometown of Charlotte. Today, its ministries of live events, radio, television, print, and internet circle the globe. Beginning in the late 1940s and continuing on to the early 2000s, people packed stadiums and arenas to hear Billy Graham present the gospel of Jesus Christ. In locations from Idaho to India, South Carolina to the Soviet Union, California to China and Alabama to Africa, Billy preached on every continent but Antarctica. Throughout the years of the Cold War, Billy worked hard to make inroads in countries behind the Iron Curtain. Cliff Barrows remembers. Some of these countries in Eastern Europe, we visited three, four, five times. And it takes a, a long time for that process of, of understanding, that process of acceptance, that he is going to be true to the message that he has to give. Billy Graham often said he'd go anywhere he possibly could to preach the gospel if God gave him the opportunity. In 1973, God gave him a tremendous opportunity in South Korea. It drew the largest single day crowd for any Billy Graham outreach, more than one million people. We couldn't really comprehend it. You know, you talk about a, a million people and uh, the incredible uh, effort that they'd gone to, to prepare that Yoida airstrip for it. They'd lined it with, uh, with uh, special tissue to mark off sections so that they could actually, as best they knew how, count and, and control the crowd. To just feel the spirit of, of the church 
communion and fellowship in that in that kind of a setting was really incredible. By the close of the five-day campaign in South Korea, more than 72,000 people had made the decision to surrender their life to Jesus. They responded to the same invitation that Billy issued at every single one of his crusades. I'm going to ask you to do something that we've seen thousands of people do all over the world. I'm going to ask you to make a commitment tonight to be sure that you know Christ and that you're ready for eternity. Millions of people have responded to that invitation over the decades, but Billy Graham says, It's not because of me or some sermon I preach or my any eloquence. I don't have any eloquence. I'm not a great preacher, but it's the power of the Holy Spirit in answer to prayer. The power of the Holy Spirit was evident in Billy Graham's final evangelistic outreach, My Hope with Billy Graham. Now well into his 90s, he spent months working on a message that was seen in hundreds of thousands of homes across the U.S., the U.K., and Canada. His message was titled, The Cross. I know that many will react to this message, but it is the truth. And with all my heart, I want to leave you with the truth that He loves you, willing to forgive you of all your sins. While Billy Graham preached the gospel on distant continents, his wife Ruth was busy with her own full-time ministry. In a log home tucked away in the mountains of Western North Carolina, she devoted herself to raising their five children, Gigi, Ann, Ruth, Franklin, and Ned. Franklin admits he was a rebel who balked at following in his father's footsteps. He eventually dedicated his life to Jesus, and today he serves as president of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. I've always had a good relationship with my father. Even when I was rebelling and running from God, my father was very patient with me, very loving, and I just love him for that. I think if he had been demanding and uh, hard, I think it would have driven me from the Lord and that my father was very wise. Each of the Graham children chose to follow a path of ministry, including preaching, teaching, and writing. Billy Graham's children grew up seeing their father passionately call for people of all skin colors and ethnic backgrounds to be treated equally. Dr. Tony Evans, founder of the Urban Alternative Ministry, says Billy Graham was an important voice in the civil rights movement. When he had crusades, People were coming together across racial lines. Of course, that was because he refused to have segregated crusades. They were coming together across racial lines in a way that the evangelical church couldn't bring them together. Billy Graham lived to see the election of the first African-American president of the United States. And he welcomed President Barack Obama to his home in 2010. With that visit, Billy Graham had met with every U.S. president since Harry S. Truman. President George Herbert Walker Bush was a guest at Billy Graham's 2002 crusade in Dallas, Texas. He thanked Billy for his ministry to the occupants of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. To Republican presidents and Democratic presidents, to Texans and Californians, to Southerners and Northerners, Billy Graham has been a personal pastor to America's first family since as long as I can remember. President Ronald Reagan, a Republican, and First Lady Lady Bird Johnson, a Democrat, were among those White House residents who called Billy Graham friend. I think it's through him that I found myself praying on an even more than a daily basis, but that my prayers more and more in the position that I held were to give me the wisdom to make decisions that would serve God and be pleasing to Him. He meant to me somebody who was uh, a comfort, a source of strength and sustenance to Lyndon. And uh, for that, I was enormously grateful. In the aftermath of national and international tragedies, Mr. Graham was frequently on hand to offer words of comfort and hope. After the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, he stepped up to the pulpit of Washington National Cathedral to offer God's hope to a shocked and grieving nation. We've seen so much on our television, on our, heard on our radio, stories that bring tears to our eyes and make us all feel a sense of anger. But God can be trusted even when life seems at its darkest. 
There was an urgency within Billy Graham, an urgency to tell as many people as possible about God's love for them, about finding peace and hope in Jesus Christ. And he understood that the media in all its forms was the most effective way to get that message out. Singer-songwriter Amy Grant recalls the influence of Billy Graham's TV specials. Long before there were any preachers on TV, I remember all programming being canceled because this preacher was on. I get on stage every night with a bass player who was in a hotel room with his girlfriend. Billy Graham gave a talk and they knelt by their hotel room bed and they were both changed forever. Billy Graham enjoyed a widespread acceptance across virtually all of popular culture. An acceptance that could be described as remarkable. And he always used that acceptance to share the message of Christ, as he did in this 1994 appearance with TV talk show host Larry King, courtesy of CNN. What is your purpose? My purpose is to win as many people to him now, and I'm doing it because he ordered us to. He said, go into the whole world and proclaim this message that God loves people, that he's interested in people. He wants to help them in their present situation, and he wants to save their souls. Throughout his life, Billy Graham always directed praise and admiration away from himself and toward God. And although it was a long and fulfilling life, Billy Graham looked forward to his true home, his perfect life in heaven. What a day that's going to be. All of our aches and pains are going to be behind us. All of our tears are going to be behind us. All of our problems are going to be solved. What a day that's going to be when we stand with him in eternity. Following the passing of Ruth Bell Graham in 2007, Billy Graham's longing for his heavenly home grew even stronger. Toward the end of his life, he once said, quote, while I know God keeps me here for a purpose, I look forward to the time when I will be reunited with Ruth in heaven. One year ago this week, that reunion happened. The moment you read in the paper that Billy Graham is dead, you'll know that he's more alive than he's ever been before and I'm in paradise. Do you know where you're going when you die? Jesus promises an eternal life with him in paradise. That's where Billy Graham is and where you can be too if you surrender your heart to God. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We can fill you in on everything about that at findpeacewithgod.net. That's findpeacewithgod.net. And if you'd like to know more about Billy Graham's life and legacy, there's a TV special called The Message Lives On that you can watch right now. It shares stories of how God carried Billy Graham through difficult times and how God is continuing to use the ministry that Mr. Graham started nearly 70 years ago. Check out The Message Lives On at our website, billygram.org. That's billygram.org. What you've been listening to is a special episode of GPS, God, People, Stories. I'm Jim Kirkland. Thank you very much for listening. GPS is an outreach of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Always good news. <laughs>